Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to All Together 2021 Town Hall, alumni, families, and friends. My name is Monique Shankle, Hanson class of 1986, and I am the Association of Rice Alumni Board President. It's wonderful to see so many friendly faces back together again after so long. I'm so grateful so many of you have stayed connected during this time. The members of the Association of Rice Alumni Board, also known as the ARA, are proud to serve as a connection point between our broader Rice alumni body and the university we know and love. Our charge is fourfold. Embrace Rice's global ambition, advocate for Rice alumni within the community and beyond, strengthen the Rice Network for all alumni, and increase alumni engagement. One aspect of our work is connecting with alumni through a variety of committees, including our recently established Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Social Justice Committee. This group is dedicated to cultivating a culture of belonging by promoting a variety of engagement and learning initiatives, including the Rice Alumni 21 Day Equity Challenge that took place last month. I was so pleased to see hundreds of alumni, staff, faculty, and friends take part in this important conversation. If you are not able to participate, I encourage you to check out the challenge resources on our website at alumni.rice.edu. One of my favorite aspects of the ARA and really all Rice alumni is this willingness to step up for each other, to support our students, and to constantly ask ourselves how we can do better. Over the last year, you have provided career advice to students and young alumni through webinars and sallyportal.org. You've hosted and participated in panel discussions, new student celebrations, and book clubs. You even showcased a, bottle, a battle of wits at game night and celebrated traditions like Valhalla. We have so many wonderful alumni volunteering in numerous ways, sharing knowledge with the broader Rice community, celebrating important milestones such as the Rice Ring celebration this weekend, and so much more. Thank you for being so engaged. As we look forward, I hope you will continue to take every opportunity to socialize, to learn, and to grow both online and in person. That includes during All Together Weekend. In fact, after today's town hall, there are several school and college receptions, a rice ring celebration, and the All Together tailgate and family picnic, and more activities. Please join us if you can. I look forward to connecting with all of you. Now, I'd like to introduce President David W. LeBron. Thank you for all you do in support of the ARA. President LeBron. Thank you, so thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, all of you, for coming. I'm curious, how many of you are um, alumni? And how many of you are current parents? How many of you are both? Got a couple of those. OK, so I, I have a complex audience to speak to uh, about a university, which is pretty complex. And so what I'm going to try to do is sort of paint a sketch of some aspects of where we are and what's going on at the university. And then, of course, we have a big announcement today, which is not so much a secret anymore. At least if you read your email, it's not so much a secret anymore. Uh, and then I hope there's time for questions. Some of this I'm going to have to go through pretty fast in order to get through uh, 
uh, get through it in time, so I'm going to start here. I, I always like to start with our, our mission, because that's what drives us every day, and it has a certain complexity. Ultimately, as you see, we are about three things, pathbreaking research, unsurpassed teaching, and contributing to the betterment of our world. And we do that by cultivating a diverse community of learning and discovery to produce leaders. And everything we do needs to really fall within that. And then our values, which as I like to say, were formulated so that I could remember them. <laughs> Responsibility. And the, the thing I'm really happy about is I'm not at a school with a name like Vanderbilt. <laughs> Responsibility, integrity, community excellence. And what I would say is those have never been more important than over the last 20 months or so. And then our core commitments, which you'll see sort of repeated as we think about how we can advance the university, excellence, opportunity, and impact. Those are the three things we really aim to achieve in everything that we do. And I want to talk very briefly about the COVID experience and how we have navigated it. Uh, at the very outset, and I've talked to a number of parents today, and I, I really want to thank the parents who have just been uh, so nice, I have to say, in, in relaying uh, uh, their appreciation for how we have handled this uh, and that of our students. And at the very outset, we chose three words that essentially uh, guided us. We also had other principles about fundamentally protecting the health of our community, listening to scientific advice, and particularly from the CDC. But the three words were flexible, nimble, and adaptable. And if you want to know what distinguished us most from other schools, I would say two things. One, maybe the, 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 this three things counts as one in that category. And the way I put it in talking to some parents today is, from the very beginning almost, we really said, we are not in this new environment, this constantly changing environment, going to try to make decisions for a month or a semester, we're going to be able to react very rapidly to things. We're going to try to have flexibility and adaptability for each individual. And that will enable us to pivot very quickly in either directions. And so if you look at some of our peers, some of them said, we're going to be closed for the semester. We never made a decision like that. We didn't tell our students at the beginning of spring break, you have to move out of your dorm room in four days, as some other college did, I'm not going to name it, and, and get all your belongings. We said, go home, and then we'll let you know what happens. And then we had decided people couldn't come back to campus unless they had a need to be on campus. And then we accommodated all the students with a need to be on campus. Uh, and then we said, you know, we'll come and get your belongings when you can. And then if they couldn't come during the semester, we said, don't worry about it. We'll store them for you at no cost. That, I'd like to say, is the Rice way. So here are the things, uh, you know, this uh, quick response. And this, you know, we had some problems with some testing this year. And that caused uh, us to delay the semester a little bit. We've had comprehensive testing, in case you wondered what that cost. Last year, that cost $16 million for the testing we did on campus. That's before the tents we built or any of those other things on the campus. And we thought that's what was necessary. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm supposed to be 10 feet from you. <laughs> uh, that's what was necessary in order to keep our community safe. The vaccination rate over 90%. Last year at commencement, I got up and I, gave, I uttered the words that nobody had ever heard a university president say. Our undergraduates were vaccinated over 90%. The staff and faculty were coming along, but they were less. They were a little bit above 70%. And so I said, looking to the faculty and staff, I said these words no one had ever heard before, why can't you behave more like undergraduates? <laughs> and so I think I'm not going to go over all this, but I think you have a sense of what we did. And, and the second thing, I said the first thing was those three words. The second thing I think was our students, who were really just amazing throughout all of this, how really enforcing our rules, participating in the formulation of our rules. We had at the beginning, we had COVID courts 
uh, for people who didn't quite get the message. Uh, but, but our students were really amazing through this process. The compliance with mask mandates, for example, that really kept us safe through this. And so we ended up safer than most campuses. Right now we're running about a 0.2% positivity rate in our testing. But I believe the testing of our undergraduate students is running less than that now. We went through a 10-day period or so, I think maybe almost two weeks, with no undergraduate positive tests. And we're doing surveillance testing still. We've now cut back on the surveillance and how often people have to go in the testing. So I'll say this, enough COVID, OK? So here's a sort of rough outline of some of the things I'm going to breeze through pretty, pretty quickly. There's a lot going on for those you know, um, who haven't been here I even just maybe a year, you'll probably see buildings you haven't seen uh, before, new things going on, and so I'm gonna breeze through that. So I thought I'd start with a little picture of what our applications are. Applications are important for a couple different reasons. One, applications get us the very best students. But applications, not just enrollment, gives us a picture of the reach and reputation of the university. And so this gives you a sense of how that has grown over time. I like to play with my laser pointer here. Um, you know, back here, the, uh, sort of uh, just after I came here, the, we had about 7,500, I think. Uh, there was initially a bump from the College World Series. That bump sort of dropped down a little bit. And we ended up about 7,500. This past year, we had almost 30,000 applications for what we initially thought were gonna be 950 places. Then we made the decision to expand this entry class, so we ended up taking about 1,200 students. And you can see the very rapid growth in our out-of-state applications, going from less than 5,000 to over 16,000. International applications growing from a few hundred to 5,000 applications. Uh, we have grown our Texas applications, uh, but we were pretty all pre pretty, pretty well established in the state of Texas. And as a result of that, it has become, on the one hand, you'll see our yield goes up and down a little bit, up at 44%. Uh, we use uh, early decision a little bit less than some of our peers. You can drive up your uh, uh, yield rate really high the more you use the early decision. Uh, we use it somewhat less than our peers. And then what you've seen is our admit rate has been down, is now down to about 9%. So uh, it's, it's for the parents, it's good your child's already here. And then just a, a snapshot of the diversity of our undergraduate student body. And we also, of course, look at our graduate student body. Uh, that's been a slower process and has also been growing. And you'll see this is about where we were in uh, 2000, 2004. And this is what we look like uh, today. Uh, certainly one of the most diverse undergraduate student bodies among elite universities uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, Part of that diversity is a socioeconomic diversity. Of course, uh, some, some of you uh, may remember, uh, Rice was free until the 1960s. And three years ago, we announced what we call the Rice Investment, or TRI. I'd like to claim I'm the only university president who will say that I can explain our financial aid policy in 45 seconds or less. It usually comes out to 34 seconds. I'm not gonna take that time today. I think if anything else, um, the, the, said, the fact that for students from families with under $130,000 of income and typical assets, there is no tuition. And that both the generosity, but also the clarity and simplicity has helped distinguish us and enabled us to find the best talent regardless of family circumstances. And here you see a little bit of the result. Here you can see that Rice has remained um, with a little blip here, but now you see coming back to the Rice investment. And this is what they call net cost of attendance. Uh, and I think this may be only among students receiving a scholarship. We, this is the one chart I think I'm gonna show you um, where you wanna be way down at the bottom of it. And, and that's where we are. That's what creates the opportunity as compared to our peers. Now, of course, when they get here, we want to make sure that we offer a variety of programs to respond to their interests. And one of the things that's been happening is a lot of new, we, we enacted the minors uh, a number of years ago, 
Uh, it's actually an interesting story about how institutions function. We proposed that we should have a business minor, but we didn't have a minor yet, so the faculty senate said, well, we can't approve a business minor until we conceptually examine the concept of a minor. And so they approved the concept of a minor, and then they approved the business minor. But that unleashed creativity all across the campus. And departments that wanted to recruit more students who might not have the time to do a second major, but could do a minor. And so I think that opened up a lot of opportunities to our students. You over, see over here, new undergraduate majors, just enacted a business major, and then also more professional masters, graduate certificates. So kind of just making sure our students have as much opportunity and choice as possible. And here you have a sense of the growth we've had. Uh, you can see back fall of 1912, and uh, I, was, I was not president then. Um, <laughs> and here, again, it doesn't have a chart. So again, when I arrived, there's about 5,000 or so total students, about 2,900 undergraduate uh, students. And you'll see two things have happened. One, we have had a couple of uh, substantial spurts of growth one between about the fall of 2000, 2007 and 2011 or 12, when we did this sort of first growth of about 30% in our undergraduate student body. And then now we're embarked on a 20% growth of the undergraduate student body. And so we project in 2025, we'll have a total of about 9,000 students, 4,800 undergraduates, and then roughly speaking, um, a similar number of graduate students. Again, you'll see that this has become roughly equal, not exactly equal in population, which is very important to us as a top-tier research university. And here you have a sense of what the makeup of those graduate students is, uh, over a doubling, but really central is the growth in the doctoral programs, which is what really creates our reputation as a research university, so about a 40 percent growth in doctoral programs, and then a lot of, a lot of growth you'll see in professional masters. And the, the business school has really done terrifically well. Now clearly a top 25 business school, I would say, um, again, back about when I arrived. And we've just had great deans of the, of the business school. I would have said the university held up the reputation of the business school. And what I would say now is, the university holds up the reputation of the business school, and the business school holds up the reputation of the university. And that's really what you want from every school that's, that's part of you. And then, of course, we've moved to online. And of course, what we've seen over the past uh, 19 months or so is much more capability, maybe, than we thought we had. But when you go online in two weeks, you're not doing the best online that you can do. And that's got to be part of the process, developing the programs, synchronous or asynchronous. And you can see very different, actually, configuration. Uh, I didn't bring the slides today of the international configuration in our undergraduate population, where the largest uh, international component would be China, for example, in both uh, graduate and undergraduate on campus. But on the online, the largest uh, international component is from India. And you see what numbers look like, what the reach of the university can be once you are in this sphere of, of reaching all around the world. But it's important to remember, it's not just reaching to a different continent. It's also, anybody from Katy? Yeah, oh, somebody. It's reaching Katy, right? I mean, you don't want to sit in that traffic all the time to come to Rice University. And so, the ability to do an online program can be really important to somebody who wants to raise their skills and get a degree that's valuable to them, but they don't have, the, they can't do the commute or they have children at home, for example. And so we're reaching people locally and we're reaching people globally. Uh, we're also committed, as you saw before, we have an incredibly diverse population. That's really just the beginning of the effort you need to meet, make. We need to have a diverse faculty. Uh, and we need to have those things that help people understand each other, help people understand the perspectives of other folks. I've always thought that was a central element in education, particularly higher education, is getting people to understand the perspectives of other people. What are the ways in which they might see the world somewhat differently? 
than you do. Uh, it's one of the reasons I think our system of the colleges of assigning people by random, making sure people live with different people is so valuable to our students. So here are some of the things we're, we're focused on. I think very importantly, a new vice provost for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Alex Bird, who is a Rice graduate, remarkable professor of history, and remarkable speaker. If you ever have a chance to go hear Alex, even if I'm competing with Alex, go hear Alex. Um, and, uh, and he really now has a more comprehensive responsibility, which I think really helps us uh, in making all of the things we're doing are known and accessible to students, uh, making sure uh, you know, undergraduate applications are sort of centrally controlled under the president, graduate student applications and faculty hiring is much more dispersed, so it's much more important that people understand what the aims are and have training. So those are some of the things. We have the task force on slavery segregation and racial injustice underway. They issued two reports over the summer, and we have a trustee group reviewing that and making decisions how to respond. I want to talk just very briefly. Uh, I can't capture it in the time that I have here today. Um, just the remarkable work that our faculty was, was doing. And so uh, I think this is a kind of little word play on um, some theme from some show that had some actor who went into space uh, rec recently. I, I, I have to say, I don't know about all of you, I've started making my plans for going into space when I'm 90 years old, <laughs> which is far into the future, just for the record. Um, so, so here, uh, Kirsten Seabach is, is uh, really helping operate uh, a rover on Mars. I mean, it doesn't get a lot cooler than that, I don't think. Um, just amazing things our faculty are doing. Jose Onachik, uh, we had people all over the campus working on all aspects of the coronavirus, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And that wasn't just in science and engineering, it, it was in the humanities and social sciences, really trying to figure out how we could contribute. You know, could we have a vaccine that you could inhale, for example? And then on the environment, again, we have so many projects across the university about climate change and the environment and energy transition and different ways to use hydrocarbons so that they don't produce CO2, for example. Again, and here Professor Correa is learning about how coral leaves got to uh, climate change. And then Kirsten Oster in the humanities trying to understand the humanistic dimensions of COVID, which are really uh, I, th I think we're just beginning to experience what are all the effects? What are the disparities created by COVID? What are the mental health issues created by COVID? We need to understand those. And then although we don't have a medical school, it's really quite amazing what goes on on our campus. Uh, Professor Tabor, engineering bacteria capable of diagnosing the disease. That's just a smallish snapshot. That's what a research university does, really push the boundaries of what is possible to see what are the challenges our planet faces and our society faces, whether here in Houston or around the globe, whether social problems or scientific problems. So all of that's uh, reflected. Back to the numbers a little bit. You see the growth uh, of the research funding on our faculty, which has really been uh, spectacular from a number of sources. Uh, most important, of course, are the federal sources, uh, National Institutes of Health, National Science Foundation, Department of Defense, um, but also you see a lot of growth from nonprofits. They have funded some of the really big endeavors on the campus. That includes, um, for example, um, OpenStax under Professor Rich Baranek, providing free digital textbooks. That includes uh, the uh, Houston Education Research Consortium working with school districts all across the Houston metropolitan area to really help schools determine which policies work. And reflected also another aspect of faculty energy and also support from foundations and others. We see all of these new efforts across the campus. I think certainly one of the most uh, well-funded and important has been the Door Institute for New Leaders. Really giving, you know, we said our you saw before the mission statement about training leaders. Well, that was a great thing because then a number of years after that was talking to very generous donors who said, you know, what is it the university needs? And 
we need to make sure that that's operationalized. We need to make sure that it's not just something we say and it's not something just something we hope for, but it's something we actually work on and provide our students opportunities to do. I mentioned before OpenStax and the free textbook, the Kinder Institute for Urban Research. One of our priorities has really been to engage with the city of Houston, provide research. That's the go-to research sort of policy arm that the city of Houston often looks to. And I'm not going to go through every single one of these. More engagement across the world, the Baker Institute, the Mex Center, Mexico Center, the Chow Center uh, for Asian Studies. Um, and, and then I'll come back to centers for entrepreneurship, for example, and then a lot of scientific things. And here, the Lou Idea Lab for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, really bringing directly to our students both education and opportunity. It's, I have to say, for most of us in this room, it's a very different kind of education and philosophy in some ways than when you were in, in school. It's both about learning and doing while you are here as an undergraduate. And back I, to the uh, 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 innovation and entrepreneurship, just all of the opportunities we're developing for both students and faculty, these incredible ideas and discoveries. Just yesterday, I was at a, a small gathering or celebration. Uh, our, one of our faculty had discovered, um, designed sort of ways to print uh, organs with 3, 3D printing. Right, so you just go and say, I, I need a lung, can you print one for me? Um, maybe it's a little more complicated. <laughs> any, any doctors here? No doctors, or one? Okay. It's way more complicated than that, okay. <laughs> but, but it's closer than you might imagine. And preparing for these things, I, I hope we all appreciate what an amazing thing the, the COVID-19 vaccination is and how fast uh, how fast that was developed. And it was developed because all of this work had been done before, all of this work at universities and medical centers and companies. We were prepared to respond to that moment faster than anybody expected. But it's not because we were just getting started. It's because we weren't just getting started. Um, so we, we need to do more of that, but then these are sort of efforts all across the university, thinking about a bioinnovation uh, building, working on new efforts in artificial intelligence, but really making sure that in every part of our mission, we are thinking about innovation and entrepreneurship, of bringing new ideas to fruition and giving our students the opportunities to learn how to be entrepreneurs even while they are here, whether it's undergraduates or graduate students. And then just briefly on the finances, here's a, uh, the growth of our endowment over time. And uh, like other universities, we had a pretty good year over the last, last year. Uh, that follows a year that wasn't so good. But the good news is if you look over time, even going back 20 years, we had a 9% average growth rate. That's what enables us not only to sustain and deal with inflation, but also we hope along with philanthropy, which I'll get to now. Here you see some growth in philanthropy. Uh, we did, co the COVID year did take a, a toll for us, and then we see a bounce back, in part because of the funding of the Welch Institute for Advanced Materials, uh, but really a steady growth in philanthropy from all kinds, from alumni, from parents, from friends, from industry, from foundations here in Houston and elsewhere. Uh, speaking of alumni, you'll see here's the sort of giving rate for alumni. And, but to really judge that giving rate, I think you have to look at this, which is kind of our US News rank in alumni giving rate. And so we're in the top 10 of all the universities. So to all the alumni out there, thank you very much. It makes us, one, it helps us actually in the US News rankings, which is nice, but it also uh, helps us achieve new things. So I want to talk a little bit about the capital plan, see how I'm doing on time. And so this goes back also to 2004. So something approaching, uh, and this includes projects that are currently under, underway at various stages. It's about $1.9 billion invested in the campus. The majority of that is in academic 
buildings and facilities. Those are expensive, especially science sciences buildings. But also, as our university has kind of uh, built out its initial imagination, in a way, to be a broad university, so finally social sciences has its own building, the first craft hall, for example. Here, right around you, I hope you can see the development of the arts district of the campus with the Moody Center for the Arts, the new Brockman Hall for the Opera, as well as the uh, uh, Alice Pratt Brown. And then next to the Moody uh, building, uh, sort of just across the street somewhere, the new Sarafim Hall for Visual and Dramatic Arts. We want to make sure that there is no doubt about our university's commitment to the arts. Our very first seal contained the word arts. President Lovett spoke of the arts, but now I think it's pretty clear in our campus, not just, of course, through the, those buildings, but also I hope you see the campus art. hope you have a chance to see the Terrell at sunrise and sunset. I got one of those pointed things on Twitter. Somebody said, why is the, were any of you here on Tuesday? He said, why is the Terrell dark? It's because every Tuesday, I think as part of the agreement, the Terrell is dark. So that, it's like a museum. It's closed one day a week. <laughs> um, and then just, uh, um, let me see if there's anything else I want to, you know, student and campus life. That includes recreational facilities, athletic facilities, new colleges, for example. The other, smaller amount, what's in the other? Nothing works without the other, right? The other is stuff, infrastructure, right? To make sure everybody's got electricity and water and all of that. That's some of the other in there. So here, uh, I'm not going to go through all of these lists, but it gives you a sense, and uh, uh, some folks have noticed. This is a rendering of the new design for the Moody Center of Student Life and Opportunity. You may have heard recently about the $100 million gift that we received from the Moody Foundation. Half of that gift is really to build the student center, and the other half of the gift is to fund student opportunity across the university in actually a range of different, different fields. And you can see here a whole range of things, academic facilities, really vital. Some of these, of course, have not been started yet. And then student life, graduate student housing, which is important, renovating kind of new housing here, um, new, new Sid Rich. You know, anybody here from Sid Rich? So yeah, so I, when I went to alumni gatherings, I would say, how, how many from Sid Rich thought the new Sid Rich had to have a tower, right? Yeah, so, so I, I, I would respond and I said, you know, I, I gave very strict instructions to my building team that they were to ignore that point of view. <laughs> now you said, well, they obviously didn't ignore it. It has a tower on it. Uh, well, it has a tower because it needed to have a tower to fit in the space, uh, but I hope you have a chance to see that building. It's a beautiful building with some of the most creative brickwork, I think, that we've seen in a long time on our, on our campus. And then uh, two projects that are uh, currently underway, new S engineering and science building, really critical, the largest uh, project we have built since the Bioscience Research Collaborative at the corner of university and Maine, so this is really for the non-bio aspects, a number of things to be in there. And then this is the new Sarafim Hall for the visual and dramatic arts. Uh, ultimately, it, it won't look like that. There's sort of two halves of the building and a kind of street that goes through the building, really intended to be very welcoming to the community to come on to our, our campus. And I really am bringing together our visual and dramatic arts folks uh, more or less now into a single uh, building. And then I alluded to before the importance of uh, engaging with our city. A key part of that is the ION, which is now open in Midtown Houston. Some of our principal tenants include Microsoft and Chevron. It's designed to bring together big tech, energy, incubators, higher education, all in one location to foster, uh, really, and support Houston as a center of innovation, on entrepreneurship, and technology. The, when we did the first strategic plan, the plank was to engage with the city of Houston, to make sure our students got out beyond the hedges, to make sure we provided the city of Houston things that it needed, like research. And then when we redid that plan, it was to engage with and empower the success of the city of Houston. And the ION represents that. It is not by our choice, it is not labeled the Rice Ion. If you drive by the Ion, you will not see the word Rice on it, even though it's a 100% Rice project. 
And the reason for that is we wanted other colleges and universities to participate in the building. And I know you don't like being in a building with some other college or university's name on it. So again, I'm not going to go, I've talked about some of these through all this list, but the, the, the strength of our engagement with the city of Houston, for Rice to be seen uh, not just with pride in the city of Houston, but to be seen as a force within the city of Houston. Uh, rankings, uh, I don't talk much about those. Some are more reliable than others. Niche is clearly way more reliable than U.S. <laughs> News and World Report. Um, but generally, those have gone well. Um, Princeton Review, other than having a terrible name. Um, here are uh, some of the things they, I just said that to irritate my wife, but um, here are some of the things. <laughs> Here are some of the things they rank on, and the most recent rankings, what they did was really look back over time and say, you know, wh what are the schools that have been at the top consistently? And as you'll see here, only four institutions were named to 11 of what they called their great list. So I think that's a pretty good, happiest student, uh, most loved colleges, uh, great race class interaction, great financial aid, uh, happy I guess I already said happiest students. And of course, my favorite, uh, <laughs> this, is a, this is a typo. I think somebody's, but that's not great fun. It's actually, I'm not making this up. That is great run colleges was actually <laughs> the, the category. Uh, and then briefly, I want to talk about athletics. Uh, uh, there are certainly areas where we're challenged. Uh, but if you look broadly at Rice Athletics, it's an amazing record of success. A lot of uh, championships in recent years, uh, and then a lot of preparation and work recently, and just I can't thank Joe Carlgaard enough. Uh, we're really pleased now to be not immediately part of, but sometime within the next couple of years, part of the American Conference. Uh, I guess it's not listed here. Um, here, these are the new members, but the conference will be put in two divisions, and in our division will be uh, Tulane, Tulsa, uh, SMU, Navy, and then North Texas, and UT San Antonio. It is a really great conference, I think, for us to be in, and so we're very happy about that. Two, one, zero, all So we are, we are launching today uh, our campaign. And so we're really very excited about that. And so I want to uh, uh, give you a chance. I assume very few of, of you have probably had the chance yet uh, to watch our campaign. I am delighted to be here. And I'm particularly delighted to be here on this occasion. We meet at a college noted for knowledge, in a city noted for progress, in a state noted for strength. And we stand in need of all three. For we meet in an hour of change and challenge. We set sail on this new sea. Because there is new knowledge to be gained and new rights to be won. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept. And only if we occupy a position of preeminence can we help decide whether this new ocean will be a sea of peace growth of our science and education will be enriched by new knowledge of our universe and environment, by new techniques of learning and mapping and observation, by new tools and computers for industry, medicine, the home, as well as the school. Institutions such as Rice 
will reap the harvest of these gains. Well, space is there, and we're going to climb it. And the moon and the planets are there, and new hopes for knowledge and peace are there, and we're going to climb it. And do all this and do it right, and do it first before this decade is out, then we must be bold. So we thought it important in thinking about our campaign, not just that we look forward, which is the essence, but also that we look back in some sense to what has made our university great. Our, our collective responsibility in many ways is to preserve the things that have been great and to make the changes that need to be made to make us even better. Here is the sort of list of things which are part of our strategic plan, the V2C2. Uh, I'm going to just go through this quickly because I would much rather get to questions at this point. Um, it has a number of parts to it in terms of the campaign. It's, of course, not just be bold, but with sort of different themes of being be transformative, be visionary, be innovative, be creative, be equitable, all of which are around having an impact on our world, an impact through the opportunities we provide our students, an impact on the opportunities we provide our faculty to do remarkable research. Uh, here is sort of what the campaign looks like. It's a $2 billion campaign. Uh, the good news is so far we have raised $1.2 billion of that. So today we are officially launching that campaign. We've been in the, what's called the silent phase. Didn't feel so silent to me for some reason. Um, but anyway, we are now poised to go forward. I want to thank you all again for being here with us today, and we hope you'll participate in the Be Bold campaign. And now I'm open to your questions. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you. We, we have a, a good, for an urban school, we have a remarkable amount of open space, and we intend to preserve that as much as we can. It's not the green space which is threatened, it's the gray space which is threatened. That is all the parking spaces on our campus, for example. Uh, in, in terms of uh, tuition, a lot of our students can afford to come here. We have limited resources. Resources aren't unlimited. If we can, uh, and I like to say I have no problem a billion dollars won't solve, but actually now I think I have no problem that four billion dollars won't solve. And so resources are limited. For the students who can afford to come here, we think they should pay not the whole cost of coming here. The tuition is not close to the cost of, of coming here. And to make sure that for the students from families who can't afford, that we can provide those with the maximum amount of resources. So I think this is a much actually fairer arrangement in terms of if, if you have those resources and we try to make sure what, what are the burdens on families. This is, from where I say it, a very worthwhile investment. We know for a lot of families that do have to pay full tuition, it's not easy. It's a hard choice that you have to make. On the other hand, the return on investment from what we see is actually, if you think of it that way, is, is pretty clear. As to the buildings, yeah, we could not build a new science and engineering building, and then you will not get the discoveries that will really address climate issues. If we don't have an institute for advanced materials, we will make less progress on addressing environmental and climate issues. What we can do is build those buildings in a very green way, which we, which we do. 
and then embark on our policies across the campus, which we do about how can we become a greener campus. And that's what we're looking at right now. How, how do we source our electricity, for example? Uh, how, how do we reduce waste on our campus? And some of it's very little things. Uh, a thing that I, that I think we did was right, but I find it irritating, is we took away trays from the students in the serveries, right? But then much less wasted food. We have uh, recyclable or disposable uh, dishes now for, for students. So we have to take all of those actions and think about how do we become a sort of carbon neutral campus and issues like that. But I don't think the answer is to reduce the facilities that our researchers can, can use. Yes? So I, I think it's been uh, it's somewhat mixed. So, so it has had less effect on the very lowest income because we've had a similar policy in place. What, one of the things that made this affordable for us to do, although we've only raised about half of the $150 million that we need to raise, and even that estimate was probably a little low, uh, but we, we were already providing very generous support, say, for, for students from families under $65,000 and even above that. So if you asked where the impact seems to be, although it even varies from year to year, the impact seems to be in the sort of area more like maybe you know, eighty dollars to $150,000 worth of income, maybe a little above that, uh, what we might call the academic kind of middle, middle class, not quite the true middle class, because if you're middle class, you're already getting sort of by any measure free tuition in, a, in effect. But I think from those families, let's say in the one hundred to two hundred thousand dollar range, I think that's where the biggest impact is. I think what we had to recognize was tuition had gotten to a level that was not affordable for those families. Right? They, they, it, you know, for uh, for a lot of people across our country, one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars of income is a huge amount of income, but it doesn't enable you to stain. $250,000 education. And at the same time, we've also, going a little bit back to your point, we have kept our tuition lower than our peers by about $7,000 a year or so. Yes? So the question is, uh, you know, with the master's programs and all these professional fields, is college becoming uh, pre-professional? Those are sort of two different things in a way. That is the graduate and master's program, not the PhD program. So the master programs are largely professional. Not all of them. The, the Glasscock School, where we sit today, offers a master in liberal studies, which is a chance for people, a lot of some, with an incredible age range to sort of go back to school and take a broad view of the, the world. But, but most of those, those kind of master's programs are really for uh, professional advancement in some sense. A lot of them are in the School of Engineering, some are in the Natural Sciences, now we're building I think more in Social Sciences, but they tend to be oriented around uh, a, a deep and broad education in relatively practical skills. Now, the other part of your question sort of implicitly is about, well, what about the undergraduate? Is that becoming more professional? I don't think so, actually. Uh, in fact, what I think is our, we see our students really taking advantage of the breadth of the education, you know, whether it's double majoring. I think the minors have worked out terrifically for us because they enable a student to say, you know, you know I, I'm, I'm really busy in engineering, uh, but I'm really interested in art history or something. Maybe I can do a minor in the in the art history. So I don't see in the faculties engaged in the discussion around that. What does it mean to have a liberal arts education? Uh, how do we bring some basic set of courses? And that's always sort of very controversial in a, in a college or university. Uh, we did enact the business major, and I think some folks may have had a worry. Uh, but I think it's going to work out very well. But one of the things I'm very happy in the business major is it's not a huge credit load. It's at a credit load that actually makes it relatively easy for people to double major. I do think students, you know, so some of it you can see is supply side, but then there's also demand side. What is it that our students want? I think they want to be able to graduate and be well positioned for employment and jobs. 
And at the same time, they want to take advantage of this ex opportunity and experience. And so I think our job is to make sure they can do both of those, that we have to structure our education and the offerings and the encouragement and the environment to do both of those. And if that's a lot of pieces, I think including how we bring students to live together. Yeah, well, we try, to, we try to do that. I sometimes think we do, we, we put too much freight in, in, I mean, O-Week is vital and it, it really helps shape their experience, but, but it's like drinking from a fire hose for, for a week. You know, it's so, and I, I think it might be a good idea to figure out how to space that more regularly. We have lots of advising systems in place and we find generally our students are pretty proactive, but I think it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a great question about how do we sort of bring that to our students more often. I do think, you know, some of it that you do is formal, but a lot of it's informal. And I think the whole uh, system with O-Week and O-Week advisors and the way the colleges are structured and the way our housing is structured actually is a vitally important part of that. As students come into contact with each other, uh, our college system really works very, there are a number of schools who have things that look like college systems, but they end up working very differently than ours. And one of the things about ours is you get to know people th in, in classes three years ahead of you and three years behind you. That works that way at almost no other place, the way it works at Rice. But I, I think it's, uh, it's well thought, uh, you know, as, as this be environment becomes more complex, how do we get the best advice, and we constantly talk about that. What's the faculty role in, in mentoring? I, I do some, sometimes worry that students come in too, too sure of what they wanna, wanna do, but you know, be careful what you ask for. I was a great disappointment to my mother who wanted me to be a doctor, so, you know. <laughs> you, anyway, just thank you. So you know, the last couple of questions, yes. And then, what, then yeah, we have one or two back there, yeah. First of all, thank you for your leadership. You did a phenomenal job. Thank you. And I also want to ask you as an alumnus, will you, how would you prioritize alumni engagement in the university? Because you've got so many things going on, if I've got money to give to the school, where would you suggest we should go? <laughs> yeah, you know, um, thank you so much for that, that question. Um, you know, if you look at the three missions, every one of those is important. It's hard to prioritize one of those above the other, but, but you know, if you said right now, where, where's sort of my, my heart a little bit? Um, funding the Rice investment, really making, and because what that means, when we fund the Rice investment, we make it permanent in a way. The more that we can do there, and, and when I saw, and it, it goes back to your question, thank you, when I saw the reaction of our community, and it, it really, it, it, it didn't matter whether it was students, alumni, faculty, or staff, there was this incredible enthusiasm because of this sense of what the values of Rice were. And, and so I have a passion for that. But I have to say, on the other hand, if your passion is, I we need to address climate change and those the, uh, issues like that. We need to address issues of disparities in our society and, and how do we go about understanding them and addressing them. We just went through COVID and that was, an, uh, well, still in COVID, but it was an opportunity to observe how those disparities play out in our society. So, so I don't wanna 
you know, um, I have to make my own choices about what I'm going to give to. You all have to make your choices, I hope. And I hope you'll decide not everybody can endow a scholarship, but everybody can do something. And, and that's really important, I think. So, so I, can't, I can't quite choose. People need to follow their passions. And, and universities you know, can't be boiled down to one, one thing. And every part of this, we have people who are passionate about the arts, which is why we're going to have great arts facilities. And um, you know, then we got people who are you know, passionate about, I don't know, I study the history of science. You know, people are passionate about that. But, you know, and I'm sorry, there's one or two up there, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah? Would I, did you say, would I add some color to the global perspective? Well, gee, I'm not sure what that means. But we, we are in a time where um, we do need to be bold on the global scale. Uh, what we're kind of think we are building relationships across the planet. I will I will say I think there are a couple different aspects of that. You know, one is to get our students out, and that's them being bold in a in a in a way. When I was 17, I went to Germany as an exchange student. It was one of the most formative experiences of my life. So we want our student. We're speaking to our students too, but then we also need to be bold about thinking what what kind of uh, facilities might we have overseas, and we're beginning to think about that a little bit. I do want to say one thing, that we're living in a world of very concerning conflict. Um, and universities have a special role to play there in bringing people together, and, and, and frankly, giving folks from around the world, in my view, a chance to understand the American system and democracy and American values, and we should be bold about reaching. And, uh, and in that context, we need to think about online education uh, as well. So, so I think we need to just have this outreach around the world. And a great example, of course, is uh, Professor Rebecca Richards Cordham with Rice uh, uh, or Nest uh, 360, uh, using technologies that have been developed here at Rice and her lab, and sometimes working with students to, to build neonatal clinics in Africa and save, I think, ultimately a million babies a year, something like that. That, that that's be, being pretty, uh, being pretty bold. Or, or globally on climate change, as I said before, working to use hydrocarbons in a way that don't produce CO2. Right? I mean, we should find ways to store CO2 in the meantime, but permanently engage in a process of storing bad things is actually not the long-term strategy. Right? What you want to do is stop producing the bad things as opposed to just storing them. So I don't know if that quite gets to your question, but I tried. <laughs> um, yes, you. I take everyone home and read them carefully. <laughs> <laughs> the question was, how do we deal? Uh, Ivan Romero da Silva, who's a vice president, really has designed an amazing approach. It's a team approach so that no application is read by just one person. Uh, and it requires we staff up, and some of that staff is permanent you know, employees, and some are sort of temporary employees, and we train people. It's a lot to deal with. Um, but we can do it. You know, my, we, my team meets periodically, and we have risk management sessions. And a number of years ago, we were had this was before Yvonne. We were having one of these risk management discussions, and you know, we were trying to identify what the worst risk. And the then head of enrollment sort of said, "Well, the worst risk he could think of is we would have so many applications we couldn't deal with them," which became sort of a running joke uh, among the risk management team. If that was the worst risk you face as a university, that, that would be pretty good. But we, we, we may have to continue ramp, ramping up if applications continue to uh, in, increase. But what we want to do is have what you know, we call a holistic process by which we read the whole application. And you know, for the last year and this year, uh, we do, we, as the SAT is optional. And so we look at sometimes at other test scores, but then we have to look more deeply at other things in the application as well. So it does, it's a huge amount of of time and thought and care that goes into it. I feel very reassured with the team we have that it's, it's careful and sensitive to it. So maybe I can do two quick last ones. Yeah. Uh, I have a basic question. Do you use Google Scholar five years? 
can I stay another five years was the question. Uh, you know, in my, my, my no 18 years is pretty long for a university president. And as I said in my uh, letter to the community, 18 uh, in both my wife's cultural traditions and in my own cultural traditions has a certain significance to it. So it seemed like a, a good time. I mean, I have to say, there are a lot of things I'm going to miss among them very much, at re interacting with our alumni and our, and our parents. When I uh, was under consideration for the deanship at Columbia Law School, which was the job I had before this, there was a, you know, they held a meeting to talk about me. And one of the questions raised was, well, does David really want to spend all that time with alumni? Uh, not knowing, of course, that's one of the very best parts of the of the job. It's just so interesting. So that's a long way. I'm a lawyer, so that's a, a lot of words saying no. <laughs> you got the last question. So my understanding is they assembled a very diverse pool. I will say, I didn't put up slides, but if you look not just at our students, but the faculty, but also the leadership of the university today. So um, I'm trying to remember the numbers of, of my team, but on 26 sort of campus leaders, deans, vice presidents, or something like that, uh, at least 11 of them are, are, are women of those 20, 26. And at, at least, I think, uh, six of them are minorities. So the leadership of the university has really changed. And I think we're going to continue to see that at all levels, whether it's the president or the provost or deans or vice presidents. Uh, this has become a very diverse place. And I know people are sort of looking broadly at that. So I just want to conclude. Thank you so much for your patience. And thank you so much for being here. I'll be around a little while if you were afraid to ask a question. Hey.